Greetings everyone, this is the business panel and we're going to be talking about freelancing and after freelancing when you become bigger than just a freelancer and hopefully getting into a lot of actionable concrete tips about how to do things, um, tricks, hacks and philosophy. And I would like first for our panel to introduce themselves. Um, Please tell us your name and your company, about what size it is, if you have a specialty or niche, and your pet's names if you have any. <laughs> Hello. There we go. Yeah. My name is Amanda Giles, and I have been a freelancer for years, but I actually just started a company this year, a WordPress web development agency. Um, there's five of us, it's called Spark Development. And my specialty is WordPress theme development. I've been in business for myself since 2006. And uh, my cats are named Calliope and Gilded Stern. Hi there, I'm Jerry Novak um, on an Upstatement. We've been around since 2008. Um, right now we are 26 people, but I'm always looking to grow that number. Um, our specialty, um, I guess, is media and publishing. Uh, in addition to the WordPress side of it, also the strategy of figuring out what kind of thing that you might need. Hi, I'm Kate Gilbert. I offer WordPress support and custom development through my company, WordPress Super Service. And I have a dog named Bolt. Hi, I'm Christina Romero. I run Care Media Designs. Um, we're a team of uh, three <laughs> developer. Uh, content manager and myself. Uh, we specialize in WordPress website care and ongoing care plans and creating websites for entrepreneurs, consultants, and coaches in uh, taking the knowledge out of their head and productizing it in online courses. So websites for online courses and membership sites. Hi, my name is Sam Hotchkiss. Uh, I started as a WordPress freelancer in 2005. Grew that into an agency which then pivoted into being a WordPress product business, which we then sold to Automatic. So I now work at Automatic uh, as the development lead for the Jetpack plugin. Um, and I'd love to know, oh, and I'm Annie Smith, and my company is called Durable Creative. We are a branding, design, and development consultancy. We do a lot of WordPress and some other things sometimes involved in actually printing on paper. <laughs> um, so I'd love to know from you guys uh, what size of projects your companies take and if you're if you're feeling um, into radical honesty you can tell me by actual budget ranges and if you don't feel comfortable with that you can tell me just sort of like what kinds of functionality and like amount of content and like the, uh, how long it takes or whatever metric you like. Um, it's interesting, my company is actually only a few months old, so I, I don't, I'd say that our projects at this point are in the, like, I don't know, like seven to ten thousand dollars, uh, 150 hours, I don't know, I don't know how you measure a project. Um, some small stuff, some larger stuff. Um, I don't know, as a freelancer, I kind of did the whole gamut, so I've done really small projects. I have websites that I've literally just done a couple hours of work on, up to you know projects that, that you know took a year and were over $20,000. And, and honestly, it was really hard doing projects that day as a, as a freelancer, so um, it's really nice to be working as part of a team. And, uh, yeah. So we it's definitely been kind of a, a long path. Like it used to be basically anyone with the smell of money would, would work. Um, our smallest project, I think, was $238. I remember someone called me when I was really desperate for work, and they were like, can you do this by tomorrow? And I was like, sure, it sounds good. So that was like the hourly rate. Um, but right now, we generally range from about 150 to, I mean, the biggest thing that we've taken on, I think, is about 500. But what we've learned is anything, or to be very, very um, afraid as that number grows, and to make sure that you know, as that number grows, and all of a sudden it goes from five figures to six figures to middle six figures to, to above, 
get a lot more eyes on it, and there are all of a sudden a lot more expectations about what you're going to deliver. And as that number gets above 250, all of a sudden the agreements and the understandings that you have between you know your team and the project team on the client side, handshakes are not enough. And as those things get bigger, it requires more infrastructure. So I, my role right now in terms of those larger projects is I have to keep a much a tighter rein on those to make sure that, hey, this company has invested half a million dollars into a project. You better believe there is some senior VP who is expecting at the end of that, they're going to have something really, really useful, something that's really going to deliver on that value. So it's not just free money. It, it takes on a much greater weight um, as those numbers climb. So like others, I used to say no job is too small. I'll, I'll help you for an hour, or we can do a full site build. But I have recently shifted to focus only on qualified clients when they're ready to make an investment in a web solution that's really going to work for their business. So what that means in a, in a number sense, we're, I'm not working with your um, startup small business owner who's just graduating from Etsy and ready for her own online store. Um, I'm finding that a, a more established business that has revenue has you know, 8, 10, 15K to invest and time and resources to work with me on putting together a real web solution. Those projects are just better for everybody and produce an end product that really helps that business move forward. Uh, our sweet spot is the, uh, the single decision owner, uh, single decision maker, business owner, and we uh, we don't take on projects lower than five thousand, uh, even when they're simple. We just that's usually kind of the threshold marker. Uh, up to five, up to ten k is typical the the range there. But we've really developed some great pro or I've developed and taught my team great processes so that we can actually build that site in a week, and so then the profit ends up being a lot larger, even though the budget might be more slim for some of the larger projects. So even if a project comes to us, um, it, it, the number doesn't really matter. It really matters a lot about the, the needs and the goals of the client, uh, how fast we can get that built, and if we are giving them a return on their investment. So it's really understanding how much they get as a return. And then we do value-based pricing in many ways, value-based on, on their needs. Um, but if uh, going with metrics, that's usually the sweet spot, 5 to 10, the single So obviously, I, I don't build sites for customers anymore. But when we sh sh closed down our agency in the beginning of 2014, uh, we were at a point as an agency we were seven developers, no designers, no content writers, nothing other than developers. Uh, and so we really found our niche in developing uh, more complex sites, and we would subcontract under a number of designers and. Uh, larger companies who had in-house design talent that didn't have the development talent to do what they needed to get done. Uh, so as of the, the last year we were in business, the minimum project that we would take on was 30K, and the average project we were working on was probably 50 to 70. Cool. You can, um, you know, you don't have to go in the same order every time. <laughs> you don't want Don't make me go first all the time. Some of you got into this a little bit, but um, can you each talk about your pricing methodology and philosophy? Um, I know there's some mention of value-based pricing. I think somebody might have said something about hourly or hourly being abandoned. <laughs> um, so if you could talk about how you come up with your pricing, and I don't know, I have strong feelings about it, so feel free to rant and read if, if you do too. So, for us in pricing things, it was definitely a, a focus on value-based pricing. Uh, you know, I, I think that you shouldn't be penalized as you get better at doing things faster. You shouldn't make less money, right? So, you know, if you're going to do something in five hours that's going to take someone else ten, why should they pay you half as much as they would pay the person uh, who would do it in ten? At the end of the day, this was the reason why we transitioned into product. Because it feels like when you're working on client work, every hour that you put in 
has a, a you know, pretty direct uh, correlation to a dollar figure. Whereas with product, you know, you spend a lot of time and that can either calculate to a dollar an hour or a million dollars an hour that you make, but you have that potential to do a good job and, and set your own path and then uh, turn that into value. And building off of what Sam said, you can turn websites, you can almost productize websites when you develop a niche and you say that this is the exact type of website I'm doing. So it may take uh, 30, 40 hours to build that particular type of site for a client once. And then right. over time, you know, it becomes almost like a product because you know exactly the stuff that you're going to need from them, and it kind of has its limitations. Um, but just like Sam said, value-based pricing—that's the only way. Of course, when you're starting out, you don't know how much you're worth, so you do need to start somewhere, and you do need to learn, and you do need to grow. But there is a tipping point, and you feel the tipping point uh, of when you know that you're just trading time for money, and you need to kind of get out of that and, and start doing some more value-based. So to, to address the question of how I present my pricing to clients, um, I, I start with an hourly rate and each task that I'm going to deliver, all the deliverables, I have a library of how much time I've spent on that for comparable clients. So um, theme design for a production agency that is going to be a lot of videos I know how long we spent designing it for other clients, how long we spent developing, what was involved in the QA. Even if I'm repurposing, you know, themes or layouts, the hours don't go down. Um, and then when I get to the invoice, the hourly rate is not shown to the client. It's a, just a flat fee for each line item. But behind that, I know that I'm expecting that deliverable to be comprised of 20 hours of labor. So I'm actually a big fan of time and materials. And the reason is because at the beginning, we did do a lot of fixed bid and value-based stuff and consistently got screwed because we said, hey, that's going to cost 30000 our definition of what is done can vary greatly from what the client defines. And even my definition of done versus the designer who's working on it and is pouring their heart and soul into it and just wants to keep going can also be really different. Um, there are many, many flaws with um, time and materials. And one of the ways that we've uh, addressed that is, as opposed to doing hours, is actually doing weeks, saying that, like, look, I don't know, 40 hours, 25 hours, you know, when we get to these big projects, 3,000 hours, that starts to lose its meaning. So starting maybe in 2012, we did all week space stuff. That is what a week, uh, we know what a designer can roughly get done in a week. We know how many hours are in a week. Um, and, and that's how we kind of like structure stuff out. And then to address the idea that like, you know, as you keep going or you know, year after year, you get better and better and more efficient, um, we just keep raising prices. And one of the, the little devices that I actually learned from our attorney um, not explicitly, but just in signing their contract, is they have like their pricing table, you know, this partner, this associate, this paralegal, and at the bottom it says, prices increase by 5% January 1st of each year. So starting about a year and a half ago, we just started putting that into our, all of our contracts. And as opposed to me having to have a call with, you know, hey, Daniel, I'm really sorry, but, you know, oh, God, Jared, you know, how can you be raising prices on me? It's just built in, and it's what they, they sign into um, as soon as they start a project with us, which means that we know that you know as we get better, we are um, receiving uh, you know appropriate compensation for that. Might have to steal that idea. I like that five hundred percent. I like a lot of freelancers. Um, all all of my billing for the longest time was our uh, time and materials hourly. Um, I think that's how most of us start out, and it's. Um, it's interesting. I think that the value-based um, methodology is really powerful and has a lot of draw. But as a freelancer, I was always afraid of scope creep. You know, the client doesn't know what they want. Um, maybe I didn't know what I was doing. And so for me, time and materials was always a very safe way to say, okay, this is this is tit for tat. We're not. Um, I don't know, just to be very clear, my time and, and an equivalent amount of dollars for that. 
But it's interesting as the projects have gotten larger and I have more and more experience to draw on, I know how long it's going to take to do certain things. Um, I, I don't think I've specifically gone to value-based, but the, the projects are easier to kind of quote as a lump sum as, as opposed to hourly. But I, I really like hourly. I work with a lot of agencies and they have a lot of, um, I guess they have enough confidence in because they they just don't even ask how long it's going to take. And I just build them hourly and they're like, okay, that works. So for me, it's always just kind of felt very equitable. But like I said, I think as the projects get larger, it's um, it has kind of, it, it shifts a little bit to value. But in my brain, it's still hourly. In the, in the back of my brain, um, that there's still an hourly calculation for me. Oh, oh you said you had some thoughts on pricing. I'd like to hear what you Okay, um, so I have moved from fixed fee pricing to value-based pricing, and ostensibly those sound like the same thing, but the philosophy behind how I choose the prices or determine the prices is very different. Um, when I used to do um, just straight flat fee, I had this Excel spreadsheet I made, and it had all all the tasks and how and I would guess how many hours each would take and you know what what each was worth on an hourly basis. Then it had um, an addition for overhead costs, an addition for um, any like a plus or minus of difficulty if I had to learn something in the project and if I felt like I needed to charge the client or not charge the client for that. Um, you know, plus or minus for things I needed to buy, vendors I needed to mark up, anything like that. And, oh, and also my favorite uh, row in the spreadsheet was PETA, pain in the ass factor, which was a sliding scale based on my perception of the client. Um, could be up to 30% if they were and, um, <laughs> and so I do this, like, so this spreadsheet, and it would take a long time, and it would give me a number, and it was basically what I learned later, like the absolute minimum I should be charging, and it really wasn't enough. And that's where I, like some of you mentioned, totally got screwed on fees. I would, you know, I'd give them a very explicit granular scope, and then I hadn't estimated enough hours because we're always very optimistic about how long things take and how smooth it's going to go, and you know that the ISP isn't going to break and all this stuff. So. Um, I, I literally think I lost money for many years. I definitely didn't make profits, which is actually how you're supposed to run a business. And um, so I learned about value-based pricing, which is still a fixed fee, but rather than base it on the, the sort of like half-assed time and materials model, you base it on the value that the client is getting from the work you're doing. And you, at least in my way of thinking of it, I tie it extremely explicitly to their business goals. So my scope might be somewhat granular as far as it needs to protect me um, from doing crazy, crazy stuff, but it's really like we have a business goal and it's to, you know, a small site might be to build credibility for your brand. A big site might be to sell more widgets or to get your customers to contact you for in-person consultation or whatever it is and that's the goal and anything I do on the project is tied to that goal so this even applies to design this is my favorite thing ever if the client comes to me after seeing you know a sketch or a CSS comp or a, a static comp and they're like my husband's dog hates blue I can say does that have any relevance to the business goal my research shows that blue will help in your industry to you know, establish your credibility and sell more widgets. And they go, oh yeah, I guess not. It's subjective, isn't it? And so I don't make that change for them. And that can be applied to um, functional aspects of scope creep too. And they're, you know, oh, we saw this site with this cool calendar widget. Can we get that? Does that help your business goal? And maybe it does, in which case I'll do it. Um, but the key is to charge enough um, so that that's okay. And I really should have said this a minute ago, but um, you determine that value by what they're, a sort of back of the napkin calculation of what that, that, that goal gets them. So if they're getting more customers, how much is a customer worth to them? If it's even a small, um, mid-sized organization, a new customer could be worth quite a bit. So if they're gonna get 20% more customers, how much more money are they gonna make with their new website? 
in a year or in six months or whatever. Um, if they're going to build credibility, how much is that worth to them? And that's where I start to base my calculations of how much it's going to cost. And then I do sort of a sanity check with a time and materials and is this a reasonable price kind of thing. But um, it's really helped me to make the budget high enough that I can really give them what they want to achieve their business goal um, and not deny them the little things and not freak out if they want a little extra this or that as long as it's in line with the project goals. So I'm kind of, um, despite not being that well spoken about it, um, an evangelist for value-based pricing and um, I would recommend a couple resources to learn more. Um, one of them is a guy named Jonathan Stark. He's um, a consultant in the mobile um, development industry, but he's, he's a really brilliant thinker on this, and he's done some great um, writing that you can find with Google. And the other is um, Alan Weiss is a, is a consultant who's written a lot of books about this kind of methodology, and he's, you got to take him with a grain of salt because he's one of these big high roller um, fancy consultants, but his, his uh, financial structures are applicable if you, if you just ignore his, his bluster. So, Alan Weiss and Jonathan Stark. Um, so, <laughs> um, what, how do you guys think about moving up market? How do you think about um, getting bigger projects and being able to charge more? What's, do you have a strategy? Do you have a trick? <laughs> So how do you get higher quality, better paying clients? Yeah, <clears throat> that's a that's a whole day right there. Uh, well, the first thing you you really have to do is to say no to the ones that are not, because if you waste your time with the ones that are not, then you are not available for when the right leads come along. So let's start by positioning yourself by writing blog posts for the niche that you think is going to be the most lucrative for you. So positioning yourself, reaching out for potential partnerships with other influencers who you know whose audience is the perfect uh, audience for you. For example, I know someone who does websites for the oil and gas company. And those are great, great projects. Those are great, great clients. And so she writes blog posts for them. And she uh, partners with people who she knows whose audience they sit in. And then she gets those. Now, after that happens, you have to qualify them. You can't have them come to you and say, how much does this website cost? You have to position exactly the value, value-based pricing and ask them what their budget is, seeing what their needs are, seeing how much of a return on investment they're going to get off of the site, and figure out what value you can bring to them in order to increase your fees. And, and because what's great is as as you know, as we stay longer in this business, the value that we bring to it naturally increases. So just all of us being here at WordCamp alone, the value is increasing. We're, we're bringing more value to our clients. We're finding out more things. So if someone comes to me and they want a website, the, the amount of myself that I put into that, it varies. If they just want a blog and they want it up and it's a tech thing, how much of my value do I put into that? If they can only afford two, three thousand dollars $3,000, I'm not going to give them advice on how to do lead gen, how to capture more leads, how to make a lead magnet how they could take their blog posts and guest blog. I mean, the what I could bring to them to make them more money is exponential. But if they're a two, three thousand dollar, I can't bring that to them. They, that, that value, you know, it doesn't, it, it shouldn't go to them for that budget. So if someone comes to me and I find that their goals, that they have big goals, uh, I might present to them that value and say, we can do this for 10K. I can bring that value to you, I can help you generate leads, I can help you grow this, but what I can do, bring that. And then at that point, suddenly a lead that you thought was worth 2K becomes a 10K lead because you're finding their goals. And, and anyway, so that so kind of starts with a little bit of outreach with positioning yourself and then reaching out to others in partnerships. And then when the leads come in, you really have to qualify them. You can't sort of just assume the price is the price. So, you know, what, what did and what worked for us was really nurturing relationships and, and building strong relationships. So when I started freelancing, uh, it was uh, a few months before uh, before my wedding, and my wife and I quit our jobs, and she started emailing 
everybody on Craigslist. Like literally two to three thousand emails a week to everybody posting a gig. And that ended up turning into a bunch of little small jobs at first. And one of the clients who we got after uh, you know about a year of doing this, they had posted they needed someone to update their WordPress multi-site. Uh, and they were willing to pay $350 for it. And so we started talking with them and did it. And uh, you know, they, they were doing services for uh, the mortgage industry. So that $350 job, by the time we shut down the agency, we had billed them over three quarters of a million dollars. They had referred to us over three million dollars in other business. And uh, you know, it, it was just because you know, we started having a conversation. We, you know, I became someone who they could trust with their technical issues. They were trying to do things that were outside the scope of what they had internal talent for. And then that appreciation became referrals and really helped fuel our growth over the years. I found I've been able to really add value by putting more time into the conversations up front. Um, if some you have a phone call with a prospect and you discuss what they want and you talk to them for maybe a half an hour and then the next day you email them a cost estimate and you say, great, I can start next week, they're not going to value you at a level that you're going to you know, grow up into those bigger projects. It's about discovery. It's about in-person meetings. Um, proposal presentations. I always do proposals in person now because I want them to understand that working with me is going to be a back and forth relationship and that for the project term we're really going to be a team to make this web solution work for them and that becomes something that businesses are willing to invest money in. So I was originally going to say just do great work, but I think that's actually uh, uh, not it. It's, um, one of the things we do, or we used to do more, is we took a project on, it had to hit one of three different things. It was either a project for revenue, a project for learning, or a project for showcasing. And not to mix those up. If we are doing a revenue project, it's a revenue project. If we did a learning project, hey, we're going to try some stuff here, we're going to see how it goes. Uh, but on those showcase things, those are the ones that when the hours go over or you know, we have to write stuff off, we say, yes, this is worth it because this is a client that you know, we want to establish that long relationship with or they're in the industry or the type of work we want to do. So on some of those projects, especially in the early days, we hit double or even triple the amount of hours that was estimated and we ate two-thirds of those. But all for the sake of, hey, at the end of the day, this thing is going to look so good or get so much attention. We're going to do this really you know, in-depth case study on it. It's going to look so good. That is the best marketing money that, that we can spend. Um, and knowing, not trying to do that across the board, because that's where it all gets watered down. You'll see like someone's portfolio site, they've got like 65 different things they've done, and it's hard to know where, where to even look. Um, but by focusing that on like who we really want to spend that extra effort on, that's what we kind of saw uh, help take things, you know, step by step, you know, year after year. So I think, I obviously, do good work, as you said, but one of the things for me that was powerful in, in upping my business was just going out and being visible, networking in places. Essentially, um, started a meetup in my town and, and kind of just became like the WordPress girl. Um, the people would come out of the woodwork to ask me about uh, WordPress. And the, the tact that I'm taking now, basically, with my company, Spark Development, is that when we give a proposal to a client, we, we've talked with them about what they want, but we give them a proposal that offers more than that. So we'll give them a proposal where, like, well, here's the price point and, and scope for what you want, but here's some additional services we think you want. Here's, a, here's another package with another uh, solution you haven't even thought of yet. Um, and then the other thing that we've started doing is doing a paid discovery phase. So you start talking to a client and, and you, you talk to them for half an hour on the phone and you realize they don't know what they want or this is way bigger than they think or you know you have all of these questions and we've just gotten to the point with some things where in the past we might have just quoted it but now we're like, okay, it sounds like you know we want to make sure we get this right for you and we basically
basically are, have started proposing a paid discovery phase where we're like, we're going to spend a certain amount of time with you, we're going to figure out what you need, and we're going to give you an actionable document that hopefully you continue to work with us, but you could take anywhere and, and, and move forward with that. And that, I think, is really powerful. Customers, who basically, it's like less like their clients and more like their partners with us. And they're, um, we're finding that the companies that we're working with now are really appreciating the fact that we are um, bringing that level of expertise in them and more solution than they asked for, essentially. Yeah, plus one on paid discovery, I do the exact same thing the same way, and it's it's great. And, and it also lets you really do a good discovery and not be like, oh god, all this free time I'm wasting off. Um, and also, um, Giving clients options is really great. You know, psychologically, you know, when you see one of those pricing tables on the web and you gravitate towards the middle one and blah, blah, blah. It's good in proposals, too. Like, give them what exactly what they asked for and then give them one that's, you know, two times or one and a half times more money and more features and then give them give them the pie in the sky option number three that's um, really expensive but is going to be totally amazing. And you'll be surprised how many times they go for option two, and they sometimes go for option three. It's 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 uh, kind of a trick, but kind of giving people what they didn't know they wanted that they really want, like in the you know horseless carriage model. <laughs> um, so this here's a uh, slightly more concrete one. Do you guys offer any retainer services or ongoing maintenance plans, and how do you structure those or handle them? Um, I'm a big advocate of the website care plans. In fact, I have a line in the sand that says you cannot even work with me unless you are on an ongoing website care plan. So when new people come to me and their website is already existing, uh, they're looking to make changes or do anything that's not kind of a new project, I will do a website evaluation where I see the structure and the bones of the site, and I will put them on a website care plan. And then we can work out whatever we need to do on the site. And it all goes back to relationship. I want an on, I want a list of clients whose sites I know and an ongoing relationship with my clients. I have a fantastic client list. And because they're all required to be on monthly care plans, which is not hard to do with WordPress, I'm speaking about it later today, so if you don't have them, it's at 4 o'clock, um, is that I have predictable income. I have... Um, I know exactly how much money I'm going to make this year at minimum. And project work is everything on top of that. So I can even structure my bills or our expenses around the uh, care plan income, uh, which is a great way to work um, and gives you a lot of freedom to choose the projects you want to work with. So you can say no to a lot of things and yes to a lot of exciting projects. So we, we kind of use it as a smaller slice business and it's because usually or used to be we would try to turn everyone away and say like no the project's done we want to move on to the next thing um, but what we've seen more and more is that there are, even after the project is quote done there's so much more we want to do so we use it as a chance to invite our best clients kind of to, to stay as a part of the family and one of the nice thing is kind of how it complements the time of materials where if we do have um, people waiting for a project we will put them on um, the retainer stuff and say you know, words we have like kind of a fixed bucket of hours for a quarter and say you know Andy work 40 hours this week on the trace see how you can make it 40 hours better just try try everything you can add features revise the design make it better and better and better and there if the hours go over and they almost always do it, it, it sort of is contributing to this ongoing relationship this ongoing product and again only inviting the best clients because they're the ones who you have week after week, you know, in theory for the rest of your business. This summer, I'm just rolling out WordPress maintenance plans at my business, and it's because I found in the past eight years working as a WordPress developer that no clients ever really go away. Um, you build a site, you launch a site, and they just keep coming back. Um, and increasingly, in the past two years, I have found that the technology is evolving to the point where these websites that we're building are, are living, breathing things that need care all the time. You, they, you need to be running.
running those updates. Um, you need to be doing backups. You need to be keeping an eye on the latest technology and, and replacing plugins when older ones aren't working anymore. And um, so I explain that to my clients. And the way it happens in my business is we'll, we'll do a full site build, and then at the end, when it's time to launch, we'll talk about a maintenance plan for ongoing support. Um, yeah, I'm just getting started, so. Yeah, we don't we don't really do retainer in my business, but we the maintenance plan thing basically goes into every contract, and uh, we I typically as a freelancer did not do it for a while. For a long time, it was kind of like don't touch the site, don't update anything. And of course, that doesn't fly anymore. You need to keep everything up to date. Um, but. Um, I've been kind of loath to, I, I kind of, yeah, I like saying goodbye. I mean, I like, obviously, when clients come back, but it's always more fun to do something new than to maintain something. But it's become so important, and it's so much easier to um, have your clients on and know that the site is, is secure and up-to-date. It's just much easier to have it up front, and, like, uh, everybody else has commented, like, you have this ongoing relationship and connection with the client. It's another chance for them to be reminded that they might want to do some more work with you, so. We have a couple minutes for questions, if there are any, and if there aren't, I have an Do alternative to interactive activity. Um, questions for now? Uh, I was wondering if you could touch on the pain in the ass factor. Um, you know, that, that client's experiences you've had where you decided you uh, wanted to move on and, and stop working with them, or red flags, any of um, the question was to elaborate on the pain in the ass factor and how to deal with it and, um, yeah, how to deal with it, I'd say. You actually talked about it a bit when you talked about big teams, like if this is a whole group of decisions. So there's a different price for when someone comes to me and they're a single decision maker or there's like five or six or ten or fifteen people making decisions. That's a, to me, that's, that's a real pain when building websites to have that many decision makers. Um, and also, I have, well, I qualify leads with a website worksheet. So before I even speak with them, when emails come in, they are sent to the website worksheet. Uh, if they get past that, meaning they look at all these questions and they actually say, okay, I'm going to inquire. In those, in those questions, I'm evaluating what type of client they are and have a client support card. And I evaluate, if one, if they're filling out the worksheet, then they're automatically pretty good clients, so that's pretty good. Um, but there's then a couple questions in there that really highlight, I mean, I've had people, like, one-word answers, you know, like, really short, and then, like, I think someone actually it said at one point someone's answer was, like, anything else you want to get off their chest, and they're like, I'm glad this worksheet is over. <laughs> so, so, I mean, that's, like, mm, that's someone I want to work with. Uh, so that's a really good qualifier. And I think the more hoops you kind of give people to jump through, the more you can kind of evaluate how difficult of a client they're going to be and whether it's really worth it, judging the budget against the type of project, like if it's a learning project or a passion project or just a revenue project versus uh, all those factors. And in terms of um, getting rid of bad clients when they become a problem, I have a clause in my contract that says either party can terminate the contract with um, 14 days notice at any time. And if that happens, all fees for any work completed to date will be due immediately, and it's happened. Um, it doesn't happen so much anymore now that I qualify my leads, and I have become very picky about the people who I work with, but um, I still keep that clause in there because um, I don't want to be driven crazy by a crazy client. That's not what I'm in this for. <laughs> so uh, I one time had a client uh, call and leave a voicemail threatening to murder me in my sleep <laughs> because his contact form notifications were ending up in his spam folder of his email. Um, after that project, I stopped taking uh, clients who threw up a lot of red flags for uh, 
severe instability early on, and I also really tried to get away from any project where the person who was paying me was paying me with their own money, right? If, if they were a decision maker for a business, and, and uh, you know, Aaron hit on this a little bit earlier from Lynchpin, uh, but you know, when they're paying you out of their own pocket, they end up taking things a lot, uh, a lot more seriously and uh, potentially uh, dangerous than uh, someone paying you. Uh, and he actually, he called me the next morning and he was like, I, I blacked out last night and I think I might have called you and said something. I'm really sorry. 